curiosity and interest or uh, uh i i mean it's a long story i kind of just have to follow my muse really but um i was just reading about virgil funny enough well not funny enough that's what the Aeneas. Just... uh yeah the ecologues the georgics and the Aeneid. In... yeah yeah Aeneid. yeah Oh, I mean, it's. I I I read the um, Revolt of Islam by Shelley last week, and uh, yeah, I mean, I I mean, there's tons and tons of stuff in ancient poetry, you know, and the themes are all very familiar to to you know. The modern day as it were um and of course the abstraction of poetry kind of transports it into you know whatever time the reader is in so anyway i mean i it, it, i i wrote a short poem this morning called uh, conquest of circuses you know which obviously is a reference to bread and circuses and the conquest of bread by Kropotkin and what have you and it's you know this idea of uh um enfolded meaning like you know it's what, like a poem is an algorithm you know and, and and different thoughts flow out of its um you know out of its imagery okay and, it, and of course poets know this only too well um and uh you know, I, I think that's why Plato wanted to ban them from the Republic, you know, because they they kind of hoard meaning a memory in apparently innocent sort of uh, bucolic themes, as it were. But but it's mm. much, much deeper than that. So, you know, reading between the lines and all of that sort of thing. So, okay. uh, um, and like, I mean, I don't, I've not been fighting it. I've just been going with it. And, and so I, I did a, I did a blog yesterday. I, I, the, a, a brilliant documentary film, which I, I, I came out in February, um, by, uh, something called Wolf Media. And I found it on the Rich Planet blog, uh, blog, Rich Hall. I thought, oh, I'll just pop in and have a look, see see what he's got up recently, because I always find his analysis very useful. So anyway, I watched that film yesterday. And uh, anyway, I, I fast forward it 16 times speed and um, <laughs> smoke on the water on it, because um, what, it ba they, what, what this documentary is basically saying is that... Um, I don't know if you remember, I made a, co a, a, a comment when we spoke a couple of times ago um, uh, about the the hill on which the um, the establishment is prepared to die on. So this is the you know you know the core establishment, the the you know the keepers of the flame of tyranny, as it were. Um, what 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 is that hill? And I think the hill uh, is well described in, in, in that documentary, which is called, um, oh, what's it called? The Corona Gate, it's called. And it points the finger at Roche, the Swiss pharmaceutical company. And of course, uh, I mean, the point it makes is that, you know, Pfizer gets quite a lot of attention. Bill Gates gets quite a lot of attention. But Roche no one's really mentioned it um and, and 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 so it looks at some of the conflicts of interest in policy make that policy makers at the cdc in the united states have uh, which which are common as well in 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 the uk and, and europe um and then it sort of then looks at switzerland of course um harold wilson famously referred to the gnomes of zurich um, when referring to various sterling crises, particularly the snake. Um, so th th this is in the early 70s. So, um, but anyway, 
Uh, and then it looks at things like the Swiss Guard who guard the Pope. And then it looks at things like um, uh, Vatican Knights and what have you. And so all sorts of things sort of come to mind. I mean, I, um, within the documentary, there is actually footage of the Al Smith dinner, uh, which is uh, there's always an Al Smith dinner precedes the US presidential election. And Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton in the one that they did. Um, I, I, I did some analysis of that and notice that behind Donald Trump in his you know, from the lectern when he made his speech um, is actually a Vatican Knight um, who's uh, ex, um, I forget the guy's name now. But anyway, he, 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 he's also uh, knighted in the UK uh, and he's a banker. Um, but of course, this idea of Swiss banking, Swiss neutrality, um, the role of the Swiss franc as a, a last safe haven. But anyway, this documentary then also uh, ties into various um, uh, Italian connections of, of, uh, and the P2 Lodge and the Mafia and all sorts of things like this. Um, anyway, it's a very, very good documentary. It's quite deep. And of course, you know, when one watches it, there are lines of inquiry which which um, you know chime with some of the things I've looked to myself. But one of the charges the documentary makes is that um, it's the taboo area. It's where no one goes. It's it's the unspoken uh, sort of power behind the throne, as it were. Um, you know who's behind the man behind the curtain. You know. Um, and, and, and so when I said about, you know, what trying to find out where is the hill on which the establishment will die? Where do you go where you meet with the most censure and pushback? Uh, and so um, the scapegoats that are offered up, um, which, um, you know, as one starts researching these things, um, you're led up various garden paths and you think, aha, you know, this this is it. This is the pay dirt. This is the, uh, you know, this is the seam of, you know, of truth, as it were. Uh, and there are lots of dead ends of that type. But of course, the, the, the genius of them is, are, are, is that, that they are, um, they, 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 there's partial truth in them. You know, it's like a, an alloy of, of, uh, uh, um, it's kind of like a a, a, a a debased currency of truth in that the alloy is not um, of gold or, or the, the drugs are cut with rat poison, as it were. Um, you know, I, 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 I mean, I, I think I'm right in saying that there is a stanza that refers to Electrum in... Um, I'm pretty sure it, 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 in the um, it refers to minarets and things um, or, 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 or maybe it's pyramids because the pyramids were supposed to be capped with electrum. I don't know if you knew that, but the pyramids were in white sort of uh, polished limestone with, with 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 the cap of the pyramids in ancient Egypt were were capped with electrum. And uh, electrum is a naturally occurring alloy of gold and silver, which, which is quite a cool little factoid. And then back to back to back to to, to Virgil then. And, 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 you know, at the end of my my blog, because I've just been finishing it off, I mean, sort of polishing the uh, polishing the turd, as it were. Anyway, Ori Sacrophemis, damn thirst for gold. Um, uh, and you know we talked about uh, chromostatics a while back and Victor F in Marvel whatever um, and, he, and what was chromostatics the study of what uh, the study of wealth for wealth's sake um, so it's which is an Aristotelian uh, notion although Virgil was a Roman poet 
and and it's this you know when you start going down i, I found a brilliant channel which um is a it's a art culture a movie channel um and the guy <clears throat> he analyzes a film which jean-luc goddard made uh which is an it's basically an adaptation of um king lear and it's hilarious this this thing that he does but then there's also another um adaptation or a play written by tom stoppard uh which is an act um it, 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 it it's a story within the story of hamlet and um two yes, characters Rose, in Rose, Rose and yes yes and 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 it's hilarious but what this guy is doing is that he's analyzing the meaning within it the meaning within meaning what 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 is language uh, and 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 it's a linguistic and semiotics and you know it's it's a really good channel and the guy you know does some really good analysis anyway one thing he doesn't an analyze or i haven't found it is uh, kiss me kate brush up your Shakespeare the song from that because that came to my mind and I looked at that and what was funny about Kiss Me Cake it, it's about two gangsters who it, it's a re, it's Taming of the Shrew and two there are two gangsters which are characters uh in that sort of um counseling this Shakespearean actor uh who's trying to get on or, or not getting along with 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 the female lead in the play Anyway, and the, the song, it, it's it's a Cole Porter song, Brush Up Your Shakespeare, and it's hilarious. I mean, it, it, but it, it's, it, that was made in 1954. It was a 1949 Broadway hit that was made into a film. And another cool thing about the film is that it was one of the early 3D films where you wore the red and the blue filters on your specs and stuff. Um, but it remember what I keep coming back is just how thin, how um, uh, famished modern culture is, social media. It, it It's become just, just so disappointing, so unnourishing. I don't remember, I, I did a blog about Boris Johnson using the term inanition of truth when he was referring to Jeremy Corbyn. And inanition is a technical term regarding uh, famine and starvation and what have you. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, Boris has not exactly risen to the challenge, you know, um, this idea of, uh, uh someone oh again uh, um i mean, there there were lots of classical allusions to to that sort of thing as well um uh what am i trying to think of now and it's just that so many things spark off, you know, and 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 um, sure, uh, you, you know, echo um, in uh, uh, oh. Foucault's pendulum. No, it's good. Say again. Name of the rose, Foucault's pendulum. No, no, the name of the rose. There's another brilliant video on that channel I was telling you about, where where he's analysing the Umberto Echo. Um, no, no, no. Um, Narcissus. You know, um, so Narcissus is, is is he falls in love with his own shadow, as as uh -huh. as a as a uh, as a punishment for the unrequited um, adoration of 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 of, of Echo. That that's that's how that story goes. Oh, um, sorry, sorry. Yes, that that yeah. echo, uh, and um, so this is the this is the point that um, you know is it possible to reform a narcissist? And 
in Boris's case, it's been proved not to be the case. In Donald Trump, you know, did did he requite the, um, you know, the 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 adoration of of the people, the adoration of echo, the echo of the people, sort of thing. Um, and that that's more of a cure ed, ed, cure its egg than uh, Boris is turning out to be. But this documentary, um, you know, points out that uh, you know there's very little difference really now with hindsight to Donald Trump and Obama. You know, they basically they both sold out in a way. Well, they both got in, and Boris did as well. Uh, they got in on the back of a lie, um, and a not so noble lie at that. A journey to the right, the Starmer project. Yeah, this is on, this is on Verso, uh, the book publishing company. It's written by Oliver Eagleton, who I believe is Terry Eagleton's son. Uh -huh. Terry Eagleton, the Marxist lit crit guy. Mm -hmm. who, I've never read, but um, is well known. Um, someone who shops at the same bookshop that I often go to, uh, who is fairly, you know, well knowledgeable about things, um, told me that she had been looking forward to this book, and she described some of what she had heard about this book, mm -hmm. possibly on a podcast. So the person who's written it is tight with the Navara crew, uh, which kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I just so there's four parts. The first part is lawyer. And then they go through the other bits. Um, I read the first part in it's 70 pages. I read it in a very, very short space of time. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I probably read it in an hour, mainly because it's not as though it's a new genre and it's not as though I have to learn a new language to get it. Yeah. I'm literally yeah. just hoovering up factoids. I don't normally read that quickly. I normally just read headlines. Right. You know? yeah. But here it just went boom like that because it was it was a bit like an injection of something that you were so familiar with, but you never quite yeah. got. And yeah, um, yeah. yeah it's uh, even though I'd been briefed on it, uh, uh -huh. the stuff, the, the many things are so heavy that you can only describe it in probably quite short sentences. You know, yeah. things like it would be difficult to take him seriously on the subject of Northern Ireland, on yeah. the subject of police, yeah. on the subject of this. Anyway, that was good. Um, a couple of other things that have occurred. Um, I on Tuesday, one of my friends on Monday, he contacted me and he said that he would be speaking at the Excel Center. So uh -huh. you're kind of your old stomping ground. Um, yeah. and, I, and I thought, oh, the place where they sell guns every two years. Yeah. Um, obviously I've not been. You've frozen, Ranjan. Uh, Just frozen. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. So you're okay. saying a place where they sell guns every few years, the, the Excel Centre. Yeah, exactly. So um, I went there because uh, he because asked me to film. It was also a Nightingale Hospital during the. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's very funny. So, so it was called Reset. And it was an environmental uh, thing. And my friend, he has a kind of organization which reforests uh, in Brazil through people that he knows and also gives educational workshops to kids. It does a bunch of things. Anyway, he asked me to come and film. So I said, yes. The thing is that it was the sort of place where you pay three and a half thousand pounds for your stat. Mm -hmm. uh, and these guys had obviously got a discount, but the other people were hardcore businesses. Now, you know, there's this acronym ESG. These guys are obviously going big on the E, possibly on the other stuff too. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's the first time. It was kind of like, oh, my God, I'm getting the band back together again. I was literally just going there for a mate to film, but I mm -hmm. haven't been out with my camera for, I, I don't know, hundreds of years, probably mm -hmm. since I filmed David Grable. I just don't mm -hmm. do it. Um, mm -hmm. So it was brilliant. Um, next to him, there was a ratings agency called Star Ratings. That I interviewed the owner. Uh, and then also I interviewed the guy who sold him the company the next day. Uh, the owner basically was Irish and accountant. Made me think of Michael O'Reilly just because he was Irish and an accountant. Mm -hmm. uh, his personality was completely different. But he said that he had designed an app which was about supply chain uh, kind of transparency in the food industry uh, for, for people in the food industry so that they know a lot more about their supply chain mm -hmm. ratings. And then he also had created something which was some sort of a network 
where other people who are in that space. So basically, it's a consulting firm that it n- deals with food industry players, but then also other people to say, and this was it. So it's all about the hard sell by saying regulations are coming in. You need to up your game. We don't know what the regulations are. You've already told me other people that I taught years ago who were from the building industry said exactly the same thing. We always make sure that what we do is above standards. You know, we just do because we're good. Um, but they were saying um, that, yeah, so they, they're kind well, of... Well, that's what they didn't do at, uh, at Grenfell, obviously. Yeah, yeah, sure. Which the inquiry drags on. Yeah, so, so he said that he does the ratings, that company, I film them. But yeah, the other thing that was really interesting was um, I found a guy who, there were these two guys, American Chinese guy and an English guy. Their company was called Nano. They make portable nuclear power generators. Mm-hmm. And uh, they haven't made them yet, but they're making yeah. them. And then they're talking it up and they're saying one megawatt. Uh, so I filmed these guys anyway. Uh, I mm-hmm. went down there with my camera and I filmed them. And now I'm in the mood to do more of that. But it's quite interesting just hearing them. Um, and so what was interesting was they all said greenwash. And mm-hmm. You've gone blank again, Ranger. Oh, yeah. There we are. Yeah. So greenwash is in the is in the news a lot. And you know how I said that their their sales technique is based on saying regulations are coming in. You need to employ my consulting firm in order to make sure that you up your game um so, so they're saying that and i said to them of course because i i don't have skin in the game so i just said exactly who is this regulator or legal authority that's going to find anyone because mm. the way i see it I, that's not really happening very much not, not that i know of. so who who are you talking about uh are you talking about the environment agency who are you talking about and they said the competitions and markets authority mm. and i think that was to do with the greenwash and today, uh, and they said SEC and people like that. Um, so I said, okay. And they were also saying if you outsource, then you know, you, you know we, you will get checked and stuff. Like that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I know um, a number of funds were fined last month. I think Goldman Sachs amongst them for greenwashing. Um, but what it really yeah, is, Bank it, it, is how the green movement, COVID-19, it, it's a monetary thing. That's the basis of it. So harking back to Corrie Morningstar's um, uh, manufacturing of consent, uh, all about Greta Thunberg, you, you know, um, mm. uh, your man who who about the derivatives the guy that gave that talk at the ls sandor 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 or all of that stuff um so what it is is a repackaging of the games of monopoly so they're changing the pieces but but essentially and the language but the rules remain the same so the fix is going in ahead of the launch of the new um great reset um financial system on a global scale and of course um how how true the bipolarity that we're asked to accept uh of BRICS versus the g7 is remains to be seen um it's i think it's like a reversal of polarity of the cold war so the West becomes the Soviet bloc, command and control, uh, the former Soviet bloc or whatever, and communist China uh, 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 are through BRICS advancing um, the idea of liberal political economy, as it were. Um, <clears throat> and yet, really, the they're two cheeks of the same arse. You know, neither of them can be an arsehole without the opposing cheek, as it were. <laughs> Yeah, you know, so two cheeks, well, two cheeks united in a common arsehole. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, one of the other things that I was thinking, because you told me about the, you know, the, the bipolarity and, and the swapping of roles about a week ago, because we were talking about the G7. Um, 
And so it took me a while. It was probably this morning or yesterday that I remembered that talk that I went to see 11 years ago of Philip Coggan, the guy from the FT. I probably told you about it. It was when he wrote uh, uh, Paper Promises, Debt and the New World, or- World Order, when he was releasing that. So he'd gone from the FT mm-hmm. to The Economist. And he basically said things that you always say, things like, you know, there's a certain point in an empire where the currency is diluted to one over 17. That's generally the end of the empire, things like that. But he also said this, that was 2011. He said, in 30 years time, uh, and he's quite good with his predictions, I think. I don't know if that's just because he keeps it nice and vague, but I think he's good. He said, it's clear that in 30 years time, the the currency, the global currency will be Chinese. Uh, You know, he, he just said that. Uh, and I'll tell you what he said afterwards, you know, as, as you know, at the end, he then said, so the question is, uh, when is the change? Um, and then he said, so let's say in 15 years time, uh, you know, he didn't say that's when it happens. It, it, what might happen now at that time in 2011, QE may have started, but it, nothing like pandemic QE and all of this kind of stuff is not, not even close. So, you know, it was happening, but it was sort of just a bit weird. But what he said was, um, because at that time, it was considered that the biggest holders of American bonds were China and Japan, you know, at that time. And so he's that's not true anymore. I think it's the Fed. But mm. um, he basically said, uh, what will happen? Will China call Goldman Sachs and say, we're sitting on this many billion or trillion US bonds? What do you want for them? You know, like, how will they get rid of the, all that stuff that they're sitting on? They won't really have any. And he basically said, China, they don't want to run the financial system, but because it's being so badly run, they have to work out a way of saving. Yeah, I mean, here. Um, so that was just one point that was being that yeah. was made then. I remember. Can I just make interrupt but it, it, a point it, about that? Uh, uh, about please the level of Chinese bond holdings, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, this might shock you. It really doesn't matter, right? Bonds aren't real, okay, yeah. and so the Fed holding them, the Chinese holding them, the Russians, you know, their reserve currency, you know, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. What matters is the real stuff and access to the real stuff. So if the access to the real stuff is controlled by the bonds, the bonds matter in that case a, as a regulator, as a governor, as okay. it were, yeah. right? Um, of the rule. Yeah. What matters, and so this is the this is the point about the Ori sacrifices, you know, the damn thirst for gold, right? Gold for gold's sake and all this sort of thing. It doesn't matter. It's the stuff. It's the resources. It's the resources mixed with the labor, mixed with, you know, so it's access to the land, access to the energy, all of that stuff, right? Um and what's going on with the oil price at the moment, OK, is to do with um, governing and regulating access to stuff through a reserve currency, i.e. the dollar. And the upsetting of that by the reality of increased Russian productive capability in oil, but also in Africa as well. And the losers in all of this are the African oil producers, because obviously Saudi are upping their production again at the moment. Iran have been a big loser. Iran going into BRICS is is because uh, uh, Iran has always been, if you read Blair on the control of air oil, Iran was always held back uh, because the sheer volume of production it's capable of would upset the cartel and its arrangement for regulating oil coming into the economy. Um, But if you analyse, right, the world of stuff, right, so this is the, um, uh, you know, the the, 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 the fecund stuff, you know, fecundity, the, 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 the the virility of um, stuff you can grow, stuff you can breed, that sort of thing, right? Um, money, which is barren, but if you have a belief system in money as the abstract thing and you analyse the rest of the world in those terms, you, you are um, 
if you if you believe your own bullshit and you're those people, right, you fuck up the production of stuff and people go hungry, right? Now, the question is, do they believe it and therefore they are just through their own ignorance causing havoc or are they causing havoc in the knowledge of knowing that their abstracts their abstract belief system they sell to everybody else is actually real they, do, they, do, do they do do they know that that's a false belief but it's a false belief which they um propagate because it allows control from the system to divide and rule and all of that sort of thing so then you you get into the real the real meat of it uh in something like virgil's um you know the 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 canonical works of virgil deal with these matters yeah so the bucolic genre okay looking at what really makes up an an economy an economics a political economy okay which is not chromostatics so aristotle is right as well and so and that's at the heart of shelley's work it's at the heart of uh philosophical inquiries into um what makes a fair and just society what makes liberty so it, it's in henry george as well um it, it's in chester belloc it's at the heart of, of 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 the catholic faith it's at the heart of the jewish faith it's at the heart of the islamic faith right um but how that gets um corrupted by ecclesiastical structures of power and who drives that corruption okay it's usury the financial system and all of those things right and 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 deflecting people from just just remembering the core what what, what are the elemental components of what makes an examined life worth living which are the components we should be examining and so it's it, it it's land energy and human wants and needs and marginalizing those factors of production or those facts those factors of uh of, of existence of life of worthwhile you know ethical and 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 and, and beautiful life right it, it that's the the job of the media has has become to be the distraction of that so that's what i mean when when i say you know conquest of circuses you you have to understand what the circuses are for so you know i'm, I'm quite pleased with my last stanza actually um <laughs> I'll just read it to you now. The middle one I, I, I was was a bit cobbled together about a poem I wrote about the Olympics, but but um, uh, it, it sort of acts as a bridge between uh, the two. Uh, I, I, I think my blog this morning is actually it, it's quite good, but it will get bigger by the end of the day. I think I think I'm going to have to leave it alone. But here we are. Right. OK, so. Uh, I, 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 let, let, it's it, 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 it's 12 lines that's all it is so come okay. see the show a spectacle to behold laugh gasp and wonder at the stories told feats of strength courage and obedience the bread of suspended beliefs magnificence regard a le tableau catch it on zoom a trapeze sans net a dramatic tune unprecedented they say they said since that war enjoy the spectacle don't make a furore. Enraptured seduce the entertained group. A low price of entry makes you the dupe. Those Roman circuses coupled to dole. If you want bread, know the circus's role. I mean, in I 12 it. lines, that's, you know, that's it for me at this point. That 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 is where I am up to. And then the rest of that blog kind of shows part of the journey to, to, to that. Um, and one of the things 
Ian Jury, Sex and Drugs and Rock and Roll, his song, right? The two middle verses. I, I mean, I, it came, I, I listened to it. Anyway, here they are, right? Here's a little piece of advice. You're quite welcome. It is free. Do not do anything that is cut price. You know what that will make you be. They will try their trickery device, trap you with the ordinary, get your teeth into a small slice, the cake of liberty. I mean, I I love your jury, but boy, oh boy. I mean, you know, what do we think that song is about? You know, it, it, so anyway, um, coupled with that documentary, um, Corona Gate and what have you. And what I did is I, I, I so I went, I extracted all of the stanzas and in in, in the uh, Revolt of Islam where he mentions liberty because he mentions it 20 times. Um, and the passages with liberty in them are, are, are where it's less, less versy, you know, less. It, it's poetic, but um, because it's uh, a poetical kind of play and it, it has a story and it. Um, the, Is it about Virgin? No, no, the, no, that's Shelley. Right. Talking about Shelley. So, which, um, which, which one's this? The Revolt of Islam? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's worth a read. I mean, if I were forced to choose between reading The Revolt of Islam or Queen Mab, I would read Queen Mab. <laughs> uh, personally, that's a personal, you know, that's a personal bias of mine. Um, but they, you know, they, they, they deal with similar, similar topics. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's anyway, I feel quite tired at the end of the, in the morning. Anyway, let's let, let get back. Sorry, I, I, I've gone on now. I was, I, I just interrupted your point to make the point about bonds aren't real. And if you analyze, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's the stuff that's important. Well, I mean, I was only saying what I was saying. Uh, based on what I had thought after you'd made your point about the kind of swapping of roles between the G7 and Russia and China, mm -hmm. and then you making the point about two cheeks of the same ass. Mm. Um, but that that whole thing of, uh, yeah, OK, so fine. The point he made was about how many bonds China was holding and, uh, you know, whether they hold them or not. But just the whole idea of, you know, whether there will be any kind of reform of the financial architecture. But I think the two cheeks of the same ass really is the most important thing to remember or three cheeks um in that um in that however much they try to block each other off in some way or another they're also dependent on each other mm. uh, you know which maybe is part of the monopoly thing you're talking about um uh well i mean the monopoly of power is very closely held and has been for a long time so i, I I, and there are different ways of doing it. The, the British way of doing it has been to enlarge the tent. But I, 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 I think what we have is, is a kind of a super bourgeoisie now, which is anything but super. It, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a castrated bourgeoisie without any ethical or moral compass. Um, and they will be a very useful scapegoat for the old guard as it were um and and i think that's already started i, I think we're going to see buy to let landlords um uh being the new enemy well basically they're the next target for looting okay but they'll be they'll be replaced by something far, far worse, which is something called for profit social landlords who are, you know, replete with the full ESG tick box greenwashing uh, and the level of uh, the, 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 the level of regulation will be set at such a level that only the large players can actually um, play. Well, you told me about them when you, when you told me about Catalyst in Acton. Mm. You know, that was that was that was kind of well, there was officially not for profit, but it was kind of in the mix, wasn't it? Oh, I, the, 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 yes. I mean, that that sort of thing. Um, it was just the sheer hypocrisy. Um, you know, damning Richard Desmond at the same time as that was going on in Ealing. I, 
you know, it, 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 but that happens all the time. You know what you said, you know what you said about having the full ESG tick box, you know, complete so they'd be able to carry on. Mm. Um, one of the sections out of the 70 pages in the lawyer section on Starmer is that when he was in charge of the CPS, DPP and all that kind of stuff, um, there was a bit where the coalition wanted to go around the world giving their um, giving their expertise to developing countries and they mm -hmm. did it through the CPS. And so the CPS was supposed to turn up in these other countries, lecturing them on cooperation between judicial systems and how judicial systems should work. And it was run by Starmer, but he was the mouthpiece for Cameron and Dominic Grieve. And, mm -hmm. and, and it included, for example, you know, how draconian they were in the riots uh, and all that kind of stuff, you know, just just putting anyone in jail for nothing with no, no procedure. But there was also a line from Ian Paisley, and I reckon it was senior. But I don't know. Mm. And he basically said that the work that Starmer did with the Northern Irish police, uh, and this is a bit like the tick box ESG, uh, meant that the Northern Irish police were able to continue using rubber bullets or be armed and all of this other stuff, basically stuff that they'd always done. Mm. They were able to continue doing it. And Paisley has this little statement saying, thanks to Starmer, uh, we were able to do it under legal cover um he gave us all the human rights language that let us just have business as usual which is exactly what you're talking about with um mm. for-profit social landlords you know they'll just make it all bulletproof from the start and anyone well, who says anything will just be laughed yeah and the idea is to exclude competition so i mean again it's a question of uh sabotage sabotaging your competitors um, and, and regulating them out of existence rather than competing them out of existence. Because the ideas of, of the ruling are so bankrupt that they don't withstand competition, which is why the censorship has to be so great. Uh, but the censorship is is much more subtle than people think. Um, you know, you, you, you don't yep. see the censorship that's really affecting your uh your your, your uh, understanding of the world that censorship you don't see or, sure well, but, you know i mean two things that i do see uh which are obviously part of the censorship um are that two or three weeks ago he said you can use your universal credit for a mortgage um and and then which i said to you at the time and then the other yeah. one, you know, even though you, don't, you can't get a deposit, though, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And then the other one was. Um, uh, you can. Yeah, just now they said that they wanted to introduce 50 year mortgages and in the comments. Yeah, so, so you can go from one generation to the next. again, one, what it is, is it's the framing of the question and, 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 and um, you know, why shouldn't people on universal credit be able to own their own home rather than rent it? When people with a mortgage, uh, even where they've paid a deposit, are effectively um, tenants of the bank. And the proof of that was the massive uh, repossessions that went on in the United States after the financial crisis and what happened in the UK as well. Right now, the. the, 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 the um, for me, the, the touchstone of that is Proudhon's um, uh, Proudhon is quoted by Kropotkin, OK, in the Encyclopedia Britannica entry of 1913 on anarchism. And what um, Kropotkin explains is that when Proudhon says, says property is theft, what he actually meant by that and how he proposed to actually uh, deal with that at the level of the financial system and effectively deal with what? at the level of the financial system so what Proudhon actually no, deal, deal with what what did it, what, what was the question uh, to, deal, deal with what? To, to deal with uh the the, the 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 idea that property is theft okay ah, so first of all what did Proudhon mean so he starts off by defining what Proudhon meant by property as theft and what he says is that he doesn't mean personal property or property that you hold or use. He taught he's talking about property in the Roman law sense of the right to use and abuse. 
i.e. absentee landlordism. And is an absentee landlord that is a bank holding a mortgage any less of a landlord than, say, a rackman? OK, a slum landlord. Right now, um, what what, what Proudhon proposed was the Labour credits idea, which Marx also picked up and ran with. But what Proudhon says is that if there's a national bank issuing a currency and people can borrow from that na national bank, OK, at zero interest to. To pay for their own living accommodation land etc okay if that is available as a source of finance then no one would would rent from absentee landlords because they could buy and, and own their own thing mm, and yeah, then yeah. the market will sort itself out and therefore yeah. you end up with a general liquidation of the of, of the stolen property okay and uh, people who hold and use property and live in the property are masters of their own castle, as it were. Right. That's Proudhon. And it it does. It works very, very well. Uh, and then when you get into it, if you read the dialogue between Proudhon and Bastiat, Proudhon absolutely wipes the floor with Bastiat. And of course, Bastiat is is the darling of the liberal um, libertarian um, anarcho capitalist types. OK, who haven't really thought it through. Right. But the idea of liberty, the idea of liberty on the left uh, from the likes of Proudhon. And, and 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 the more cuddly side of Marx. So this is this this is the Das Kapital Marx, not the Communist Manifesto Marx. Right. Um, there is such a thing as libertarian Marxism, believe it or not. I mean, I'm not a Marxist. I, I do use Marxist analysis, and I think Marx's analysis, analysis of capitalism is, is, is some of the best there is. And I claim you can't be a capitalist without having read Das Kapital. You know, you, you, you don't know what capitalism is unless you've read Das Kapital or derivatives thereof, right? Um, but, you know, the Communist Manifesto does not help you understand capitalism at all. It, it, it's just a faulty prescription. You know, uh, that's my view. So um, but but Proudhon is is, 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 is is quite something apart from that, you know, and Bakunin and all the rest of it. So um, and of course, Bakunin and Marx really didn't like each other. Um, uh, but just just on the economics of it, or, you know, just on the political economy of it, then rather than that, um, you know, I, I I think Proudhon's prescription is the one we should be looking to uh, in, in in this current conversation about what's called the housing crisis, which is actually a crisis of affordability. I'm misdiagnosing that as a crisis in productivity in the building industry. And those lazy labourers or those expensive bricklayers and all of this sort of thing. OK, that's a deflection, the deflection. Um, and, and the core of the problem is, as was um, diagnosed by Proudhon way back then in the mid 18th century, the mid 19th century. Um, but of course, people don't dig enough to get as far as that. Um, uh, there are so many distractions on the way. Um, and. The voices that get an airing um, in the media as we see it today are, are never going to go there. That's not their job. Mm. Um, so, so anyway, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. So, so, so that idea that oh, suggesting people on social credit should be able to get a mortgage. I think they should. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, based on the idea described by Kropotkin in 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 summarizing the views of Proudhon. Yeah, uh, it's quite interesting in the comment section, uh, I because I just had a quick look at the comment section and somebody says, what happens if you have a multi generational mortgage and uh, you have to pay for your, um, you know, for your old age, you know, your care? Yeah, if you have to I mean, my, my question is this, does it matter that it's multi generation? I mean, you know, if you're renting multi generationally, you know, and, and you're in insecure, uh, you know, badly maintained property that's that's 
you know, just just enriching um, the landowner uh, and the culprits. You know, it's not the buy to let landlords per se. It, 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 you know, this is Cahill's point about who owns Britain. This is the aristocracy. That's the real power. And no one no one's challenging them. You know, and that book that he wrote whenever it was in 1995, that's sunk without trace. I'd lay odds it's no longer in print. What is it called again? Is it Who Owns Britain? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, and it's come out various times since. I and mean, there are lots of brilliant books that have been um, purloined using the same title by horrible neoliberal historians such as that guy, you know, the guy I'm talking about, Ferguson or whatever he's called? Neil, Neil Ferguson, yeah. Neil Ferguson, you know. Uh, even, um, you know, he, he, he's stolen two of David's fathers, you know, The Ascent of Man. Um, and, and, and the Ascent and, of Money. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one, um, uh, oh, The Age of Uncertainty and all the rest of it. I mean, he's obviously, you know, <laughs> uh, and this happens a lot. You know, you see blogs re reappearing with the same title of stuff that was really good and it's now shit. And, and, and the other ones disappeared. And it's a way of it's a way that the Internet filters make sure that people don't know what to search for, even on the way back machine anymore. Mm. You know, like Room one's got awfully sophisticated in, in, in the day and age of the uh, the URL. Well, I really like your poem. Um, I think it was uh, obviously written because you wanted to write it. But um, in my case, you know, things are going OK for me relatively at the moment. But uh, as I said, it's nice to pull the camera out. But um, I could do with that level of kind of context and reminder of what the game is. Mm. Um, just uh, to remind me a little bit more about where I'm coming from so I don't kind of lose my anchor and mm. just wander off. Because I did actually have a look at uh, what's on at the XL this week. Because I thought, oh, whereas before when I was a real media, I'd say to in a meeting, oh, let's get this guy. We know them. Someone knows them. Mm -hmm. I don't even need to be there. Here are the questions. And we could get stuff out. But it was kind of amongst friends. But mm -hmm. then I thought, oh, what about if I want to start getting some views from people who are more in small business or, mm -hmm. you know, small and medium sized business? If anyone agrees to be videoed by me, then I suddenly realise I can ask them questions about stuff that's in the news cycle. Maybe I'll get some interesting answers. Regardless, it's still good to listen to people. And yeah. uh, so I thought, let's have a look at what's on. And basically tomorrow and the day after, they have a conference called Governance. Yes. Yeah, so, mm. I mean, this is not something that I would typically have noticed. But because mm. I, there was no choice, I looked at it, you click. I've sent a message to somebody because it's 900 quid to get in uh, three or 400, yeah. <laughs> three or 400 quid as a student. So I've just said, I just want to go there and film. It people. sounds really democratic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And but in the in the blurb, they say every yeah, dollar, one, every dollar a vote. <laughs> one dollar, exactly. one vote. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and in the blurb, they said we are the G of ESG. You know, and and you know, nine hundred dollars a ticket. Yeah, yeah. Right. And they're talking, they're talking about stuff like equality and stuff like that. Mm. So I mean, I didn't even realize. I mean, I'm just telling you this as a matter of fact. I'm not even mm. talking to you about the cost <laughs> as if this is a bad mm. thing. You know, because I just accept that this is what they're doing. Um, so I've left a message to say, look, can I come in essentially as press, as a mm. blogger, um, uh, just to listen to people telling me about the amazing mm. things they're doing? And so it's mm. really interesting to see the people that are there. They're kind of government, but they're all these other mm. people um and so that's sort of part of my potential strategy for what i'm mm. going to do you know at the moment is see if i can go to places and ask yeah. questions of people that are kind of hopefully they won't give me don't I mean, forget, basically, don't, don't give up on gb news speak to that producer that produces liam halligan oh uh, yeah i might even be able to sell them that mm. video that i've got of the nuclear generator Ooh. people yeah quite um, possible yeah yeah but i i would keep in touch with them if i were you yeah. Shall I let you continue with your day? Because um, I really appreciate everything that you told me. But um, no worries. I'm going to have to get on and do a bit of bit of work. But when this video pops up, I'll probably upload it and put it at the end of my blog. Because I, I okay, brilliant. I, I think my twelve lines poem kind of explained myself, but it you know it, it's a lot deeper than that. I mean, I'm going to. 
I, I will be watching UK column today to see what what, what they say. I mean, the, uh, both independent republics of the Ukraine have fallen now, I believe. Um, mm. And uh, which actually may be uh, a, a good, it would be a very good juncture for peace talks and a ceasefire. Um, and it would be <coughs> interesting to see if, if, if that does actually uh, come through. I mean, of course, Boris is warmongering away like mad and the mad witch, um, you know, whatever she's called, Liz Truss. No, Liz, Liz Truss. Truss. Uh, she, she, she's still, uh, I don't know, she, she, she's still running around with her strap on. <laughs> well, I think apparently, apparently it's the Canadians. Apparently it's the Canadians that are absolutely, they, they, they love this. They, they really love it. I don't know if their foreign secretary, Krista Freeland, she may be of Ukrainian extraction herself, XFT reporter. Oh, no, you're right. there is one there that is. Um, they love it. But they, they were up to their necks in TTIP and dis, uh, investor state dispute resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, again, I got TTIP into one of my blogs the other day as well. Um, that there's a, um, a VPRO documentary called Might is Right about TTIP. I was trying to find the, inter someone did an interview with an EU commissioner that was, you know, basically the idea that anyone could be involved in anything they were doing was just completely alien. It's going, what's wrong with that? We're, you know, we're, we're the best people to do that, you know, democracy, bar democracy, that sort of thing. Um, but I couldn't find that one. But but this VPRO documentary, which is about the same time, is very good. David's talk's very good on TTIP, by the way. Yeah, um, there's a good one called, um, I put it on my blog in the past, so it's probably not very well listed, The Truth About TTIP. Mm -hmm. And at the end, there's an there's an interview with uh, my old friend. I haven't spoken to for ages. Linda Korsha, K O U K A U C H E R. And and in her bit, she actually says she starts. She's got an Australian accent, and she says the language they use when they do TTIP. And then yeah. I think they do some visuals. Well, look, here, here's uh, one, Rand Jen. I mean, the Great Reset. What else is it apart from TTIP? I mean, it, it's the, it's the <laughs> yeah. same thing. Um, and, and so it's just a rebranding of the same old shit that won't work for us. But the point is, it works for them. Who are them? Who is they? Watch um, Corona Gate, and you get some answers. Okay, right. Are you going to put I, a link I, on your blog too to Corona Gate? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I downloaded it. I uploaded it to Bitchu. I've, I've done the blogs to odyssey Brilliant. of the original thing a, a link to it on um rich halls rich planet and all the rest of it um can i tell you what I, can i tell you can i tell you what i ought to do because i'm actually trying to do some moving around for various reasons here so there is one room upstairs which has got fewer books than before but it is almost completely full of books and so for the first time i'm going to start accessing some of them and moving them around so it means that suddenly they go through my sticky fingers mm -hmm. and so um there's one i'm particularly looking out for i should be even more than usual i mentioned it to you before shadow sovereigns by susan have George. you not got them indexed your book not at all not you at should. all I, 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 it's a big job but yeah. you know having all those books that have been collected with passion if not obsession yeah. <laughs> okay yeah Really, uh, uh, an index, Thanks. you know, I, I, I don't know. It'll make life easier. Are yeah. you still seeing your, 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 yeah, your yeah, friend? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, she's some sort of like, you know, li yeah. you know <laughs> exactly. Yeah, enlist the help of a librarian. Okay, uh, uh, yeah. Just get, seriously, I mean, it, it's, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. Build some bookshelves yeah. too and, and, and index them. Because, you know, like your mate with his, his collection of ephemera, yeah, Ron. Yeah, I, again, you know, because that would make a wonderful, wonderful video of your yeah. doing the index of your book collection. Oh yeah, and then doing a well, this is what the collection is, and from doing this exercise, because it, yeah. it's a formation of the world. Because when we talk, you often say, "Oh, there's this or that, or there's this book or whatever," and you've just shown that bit book now about Star. Mm. You know, I mean. Mate, it's that's in real life. That's real time um, social knowledge. It, it, okay. It's part of the cultural memory in the zeitgeist. 
right? Yeah. It's kind of there, and us talking kind of accesses it, but to, you know, to get it out there, you know, just, just a published, Order. I mean, that would make such a fascinating blog. Okay. Seriously. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, well, good talking to you. And you too, Ranjan. Cheers, mate. Take care. Thanks a lot. Enjoy that, mate. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.